Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. And what I'm going to talk about is, is also part of this, this Irene project. Uh, so you'll see and you'll recognize the ensign, uh, I'm sure, that I'm going to uh, talk about. And so this, uh, I should start by saying that this is uh, the first half of the talk is really the thesis work of, of Martin Hedegger, who's a, a PhD student in my, in my group. And it was done in collaboration with, among other people, uh, Alan Svensson uh, from Novel Science. Uh, oh, yeah, and the, the slides are available. Most of the slides are available uh, on this side here. And also, it's um, submitted to plus one, and it's redeposited in an archive, so it's, it's freely available now. Uh, and so, because you can read about it now, I'll just really give you the highlights um, of what this method is about. So this was a very uh, interesting collaboration uh, to have with people in industry. I learned a lot about how industry works. And so uh, what you have, you have to sort of put yourself in the mindset of, of an industrial um, design process, uh, at which, because that's really what dictated how we, how we developed the method that we, that we developed in the end. So, so what are we up against as computational chemists? Uh, if you ever go to Novoscience, they, they can uh, show you a, a lab full of robots that can do mutants automatically. Uh, and so high throughput screening of mutants um, is, is, has become a really effective, uh, certainly efficient process where you can screen hundreds and hundreds of mutants. Uh, so that's what we're up against. What are they, what are they getting from these um, uh, screening processes? Well, they use them to identify promising candidates, right? If you're doing uh, hundreds, or maybe thousands of mutants, you know that every data point is not going to be, it's not going to be possible to test that thoroughly, right? So you have to take these um, high throughput uh, studies, experimental studies, with a grain of salt, right? So you simply read out uh, some of the more promising ones, and then you study those in more detail. Maybe they work out, maybe they don't. Uh, so that's on the experimental side. Uh, for on the computational prediction. I would say the most commonly used methods in industry, this has to be fast, right? You, you either try to design mutants based on homology uh, with other enzymes that do something similar or with, with QSAR. Or you just use your, your chemical intuition and you, you stare at crystal structures for a long time. But I would say sort of within industry, uh, QM or QMMM based methods have not really caught on as far as I know. And, and one of the reasons is that it's, uh, it's, it's relatively slow. Right? You have to predict mutants very fast to, because you're up against uh, ex uh, experimental people who can do this very fast. And so if you can measure it faster, why, why worry about predicting it? Uh, another thing is also that it lacks automation. Right? So <coughs> you have a lot of computer time, but you don't have an army of, of students that you can sacrifice and, and put them in front of, of, of screens and, and, and create this by hand, right? So you need some degree of automation. And I would also argue that that's, that's also lacking in these, in these methods. So either way, from, from here or from here, the goal is to identify uh, anywhere from, from 20 to 50 mutants that you can then study in more detail with a, with a more um, well-developed assay and a lot of human intervention. But still, uh, further study here means just a, a very basic screen for activity. So no KCATs, no KMs, or anything like that. Right? If you take your mutant, you give it some substrate, you wait for a while, and then you see how much you get. Right? And if you get more, you're happy. If you get less than wild type, you're, you're unhappy. But any sort of further extracting of details here is not really warranted, because in the end, you just want an enzyme that works. So that's sort of the background. Uh, and so with that in mind, our goal was to uh, develop a QM or QMMM method uh, that could predict, that can predict the relative uh, barrier heights, so the effect of mutations on bar barrier heights within 24 hours on less than 10 cores for a single mutant. Right? And it has, of course, to be automated. Right? The 24 hours is there because uh, we're going to, when we look for mutants, we're going to do this in the end 
eventually with brute force. Right? So if you have 100 or 500 cores, right, you can test hundreds and hundreds of mutants in a reasonable period of time. And the idea is really that this would be a, a supplement to doing this experimentally. Right? So we're not interested in the, well, we're not unhappy if we can't get the absolute barrier height. Uh, we want, again, to identify promising candidates that can be studied experimentally. Okay. So that's the, that's the idea. So what I'm going to tell you about is basically version one of this method. Uh, we learned a lot by developing these methods, and we have some ideas on how to improve this, but I'll tell you what we came up with as a, as a first shot. Um, so it's, it's quantum mechanics in quotation marks. It's PM6, uh, which is a, a relatively new param parameterization method. It's available in MOPAC 2009, where it's also been implemented in, uh, in, a, in a MOSIME algorithm. MOSIME algorithm is a linear scaling method that makes these calculations run much faster. And as I'll show you, this is sort of, this is sort of key. So MOPAC 2009 is freely available to, to academic research searchers, but, but industry has to pay a little bit. So that's what we base it on, PM6, so a semi-empirical method. Um, when we build mutations, that's, it's automated, but it's based on PyMol. So the way PyMol makes mutants, predict mutant structures, <laughs> those are starting points. And when I say, so we don't find a transition state, we estimate the barrier based on adiabatic mapping. So adiabatic mapping, mapping simply means that we start with the reactants and products, and then we force the reaction to proceed along some reaction coordinate, and we calculate the energy at about 10 points in between, and the highest point will be our estimate of the barrier. Okay, and I'll show you more, more details about this. Now, the, the system we tested this on was was CalB, as you've heard about before. And the idea, so this is part of the, one of the work packages in the IRENE program, was, was a really sort of attractive um, problem from a physical chemistry point of view. So the idea, because I could understand it. Um, so it's an esterase. That means it hydrolyzes an ester bond where this uh, nitrogen here is replaced by an oxygen. And so the idea was simply to ask, what mutations do you have to make so to Cal B so that it will cleave an amide bond better, right? So very simple sort of physical chemistry uh, question, at least from the, from the substrate point of view, right? So that was the question. We're going to predict mutations that will increase, uh, the, that lower the barrier, increase the activity for amidase compared to the wild type. Okay, so there's a, there a bunch of things from a computational point of view that, that we had to convince ourselves of. And so one is, uh, is PM6 good enough? Right? So it's a semi-empirical method, uh, and this was our first real work with it. I came from, a, I've used semi-empirical methods before, but things like AM1 and PM3. Uh, and these are, not, these are not very good for this kind of... Um, for this kind of reaction. So AM1 and PM3 have real problems with the basicity of nitrogen groups. Uh, and so, in fact, for PM3, uh, it actually gives you the wrong reaction mechanism. So uh, the, the histidine will happily extract a hydrogen here, and this negative serine will sit around, and this is a perfectly stable minimum. So, of course, that's not good. What we found is that PM6 uh, is a significantly uh, is a significant improvement when it comes to the predicting the reactivity. So here are some examples. Uh, so we did on a small model. This is basically the model. We just wanted not to test the barrier or anything like that, but just to test the method. Uh, at a fairly low level, we find a, a barrier height of, of 21 kilocalories per mole. And if we use uh, PM6 structures and uh, the same level of theory for the single point, we get a, a reasonably good um, agreement. You can say you also do that with AM1, so why not use AM1? But AM1 has, has real problems with the structure, right? So this is the OH uh, in the transition state. This is the OH distance, and the O, where is it? Uh, the O 
H distance, OC20 distance, that's here, right? So that's this carbon here, right? Compared to ab initio, right, AM1 has significant overestimation of this OH bond. So the transition state structure is wrong. PM6 has a really good structure. Uh, the data point I haven't shown you here, but is th that we also found is that if you just do PM6 without the single point, you also get a very reasonable barrier. So in, in our hands, PM6 is sort of a real advance in the, in the semi-empirical fields when it comes to reactivity. There are also other papers out there on completely different transition state structures that, is, that have found the same thing. Okay, so PM6 is good enough. Uh, so here's, here's where it gets a little complicated because the, the solution or the, the devil here is really in the details. Uh, so if you use MOPAC, uh, if you download that, there's, there's two kinds of PM6 uh, that in principle ought to be the same but in practice are not. There's the, what I would call the conventional PM6 and then there's MOSIME which is, also gives you a PM6 energy, but in a much, much faster way. So it's a, it's a linear scaling implementation. Okay, the problem is that you don't get exactly the same energies. Okay, so there was a lot of, uh, that took a while to figure out, but here's, the, here's one example. So this is the wild type enzyme. Here you have the enzyme, enzyme substrate complex. Here you have the tetrahedral intermediate. As I said, we interpolate between the two. Right? And this would be our, guess, our best guess at the barrier. Um, if you calculate, so all these structures here are optimized with Mosin on a, on a fairly big system. I'll show you the, uh, the system on, on the next slide. Um, but you optimize using exactly the same method, right? But if you, then you get, and if you take the energies from the same optimization run, you get this green curve, right, which is a little bit jaggedy. If you do PM6 single points on top of this, you get the red curve. So you can see the transition state has changed and the barrier height has changed quite a bit. Right? So, so in principle, they're both PM6 energies, but the approximations that are introduced in Mosheim in order to make it faster results in an, in an error um, and the error is quite big compared to what we want to predict. Now, we did find out later that if you simply, uh, this error comes in part from errors that accumulate in the geometry optimization. So if you simply take the geometry again and do a Mosheim single point, things get somewhat better, right? But you still see that there are some differences here. So for the work I'll show you, uh, the, the, the results I'll show you later, we base it on PM6 single points on top of Mosheim optimizations. Uh, here's, the, here's the system uh, we tested it on. So we, we tried uh, several different sizes of systems. This is the one we settled on. And the main reason is because we, the goal was to uh, get these geometries and energies in 24 hours, right? On a, on, and this, in this case, this is on one core per optimization. So one problem is that MOPAC 2009 is not parallelized. And so it doesn't matter if you have 100 cores sitting around being idle. You can only use one of them for a single geometry optimization. That's a, that's a real problem. Now, we, we do parallelize in the sense that we do every point every point on this path independently. So 10 cores can work on each of the 10 points. Uh, so it's kind of a coarse grain parallelization. But if any single optimization takes significantly longer than 24 hours, right, then uh, the method is not fast enough. So the point is here that this is the, this is the optimization in hours. Uh, this is based on the wild type, so this is the worst case scenario. If you take the PDB structure, it could also be a molecular dynamic structure, and start optimizing how long do you have to wait until you find a minimum. And of course that depends on a whole bunch of cutoffs, both in the method that you use to calculate the energy and in your optimization. And so uh, we found a happy medium where, again, less than 24 hours we can, we can manage to get this. And like I said, this is a worst case scenario. So 
the, the main take-home message of this slide is that in this first go-around, we, we do not work on the entire enzyme. We work on a, on a subset. Uh, but if we do that, then the method is definitely fast enough. As I'll show you, uh, we plan to start working with, with full proteins. Um, but in the results I show you, they're based on, on this model system. Okay, so here's a, li a little more detail, right? As I said before, if you start from an X-ray structure and, and simply minimize, that's the worst case scenario in terms of how much time it'll take. Uh, if you, because when we generate these points in between, right, we don't, what we do is interpolate between an optimized enzyme substrate complex and an optimized uh, tetrahedral intermediate complex. And so actually the points you need in between to generate uh, the various points on the reaction barrier, right, is significantly less. So at most 10 hours on a single core, right, because most of the optimization of the surrounding, uh, the, the surrounding protein matrix is, is already done. It, it changes very little when you interpolate. So in, f in future, we'll probably, be that, that this will allow us to go a little bit bigger in model system because um, you're basically adding protein matrix that won't really contribute very much uh, to the number of steps you take when you optimize. It will contribute to the cost of evaluating the gradient at each step, but uh, we think that can be overcome. Okay, finally, on top of this, right, you have to add the cost of doing a PM6 single point, which takes about an hour or so uh, per point. Okay, but again, bottom line is fast enough. If you decide that you can live with this Mosheim single point, then that is an absolutely negligible uh, contribution to the, to the time. Okay, so, so here's the general workflow. Um, so you want to study a new, um, you want to predict mutations for a new reaction. What do you do? Well, you start with the crystal structure. Like I said, that can also be an MD uh, snapshot. Right, so the method is fast enough to, to average over certainly a handful of MD snapshots. Um, you truncate the model, right, you make it smaller, uh, and, you, and you optimize. And here are some cutoffs you have to use. After you built in the, either the enzyme substrate or you build your intermediate. Uh, so that takes about 18 hours. Uh, in this case, we started with the tetrahedral intermediate, and that would be my recommendation. If, if you have a covalent, an intermediate that's covalently bound to the enzyme, you have fewer degrees of freedom. Start with that, right? So from this structure, we then break the bond and let it find the enzyme uh, substrate complex that's closest in structure to the tetrahedral intermediate. This may not be the way it, it binds, but I would, uh, it, it's probably how it's going to look before it starts reacting. Right? And so that already takes a lot less time because uh, most of the protein matrix is optimized. Okay. And again, this is a one-time thing because this is for the wild type. So in fact, cutting this down to 24 hours was probably a little bit conservative in terms of time. Okay, now you interpolate. Um, oh, sorry, now you make mutants, right? And so that's very fast, of course. Uh, at least in the, in the pi-mole way, which uses a very, very coarse scoring function. Um, and so you, here you can make many, many mutants, and of course that can be done in parallel. Okay, now you need to find the reaction path that connects the two, right? And so, for example, mutant 1 enzyme substrate complex is paired with mutant 1 tetrahedral intermediate, so the same mutant, right? You create 10 points in between, and for each of these points you do a constrained optimization uh, along the reaction path. And the reaction path is, in this particular implementation, is generated simply by an interpolation of the coordinates. So it's automated. In principle, once you've built this and built this, you don't have to think anymore. That's, of course, a compromise. Okay. Then you have uh, 10 different optimizations you need to do. Right? And so, of course, that can be done in parallel on separate cores. Uh, and again, as I've shown you, each of these optimizations take about at most 10 hours on a single core, and from that you can get the reaction barrier. And of course you can do that for each mutant. Right? And so if you have 100 cores uh, available, you can test a lot of mutants in a 24-hour period. Right? 
And if you have 500 cores, you can test an awful lot of mutants in three weeks. All right, so the, the main goal of this is actually, a, a, again, a brute force screening. You could imagine with this doing all single mutations that you're interested in. Uh, so every single amino acid in your, in your model, you could mutate that to the 19 other possibilities if you wanted to and just do a, a brute force screen. And then you could take the best single mutants, combine them into double mutants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's actually not quite what we did um, because we were developing the method along with the mutants being made, right? So in industry, they don't wait for you. They, they do the mutants, uh, and then they wait for you to catch up. So, so these mutants, unfortunately, I can't show it to you because of, of patent issues. Uh, but here's what you have. You have a bunch of each of these lines is a mutant. If uh, so let's take this one. So here, experimentally, when you made the mutant, the rate incre increased. And by rate, I mean the activity. After 18 hours, you got more product than you did with the wild type. That's what you know. Uh, and so that's an improvement, so we give it a plus one. Right? I'm not telling you how much is improved, right? because uh, the numbers also in, in the... Um, for the activity, could, could it include a lot of different things? I'm just telling you it improved. I can tell you it didn't improve very much from a, let's see, an industrial design uh, aspect. So maybe you know, a factor of seven or 10 or something like that over wild type. Now, okay, computed. Uh, again, we, get, we give it a plus one because the barrier compared to wild type is similar. So I'm not saying it's necessarily lower Right? because we don't trust our calculations that much, but I'm saying it's similar. So it might have been two kilocalories per mole higher. Right? We would still tell our experimental friends it's worth making this one because it's not horrible. Right? It's worth doing. It's worth including this. If you want our best guess right now, make this mutant one of the 20 or 50 you're going to try experimentally. Now, in this particular case, the barrier actually was... Uh, was lower. Okay, so as you can see, sometimes we disagree, right? So, for example, here experimentally, this one did turn out to be better, and we would have told people not to try it. Right? So, so that's a, see that's a bad case scenario. But there are also cases here where this turned out to experimentally, this was uh, worse activity or within, let's say, 20% of wild type activity, which is probably within the, the experimental errors, right? It's not worth trying, and we would have told them exactly the same thing, right? And then, of course, there, there are cases where we disagree. And, okay, I'm happy to say, finally, we're faster than the experimental people, right? So we can now make predictions of mutants that are, in our mind, are worth doing, right? But, of course, with the caveat that sometimes we say it's worth doing and it turns out not to be worth doing. Okay, so, so that's, that's where we're at now with this method. So we're not always right on, but at least we're fast. And actually, that counts a lot, right? Because you have to think, what are the alternatives, right? You have people standing ready, ready to do mutants. They want to know what to do. Right? In the absence of this, right, what are your other options? Well, you can sort of homology model. You can eyeball it based on an X-ray structure. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do these things, right? but at least now you have an additional tool uh, that you can also use to screen very, very fast. And you can screen it automatically and brute force. Right? So you can tell it do all 20 substitutions at this site. Right? So it might come up with suggestions that you wouldn't have thought of by just eyeballing the structure and, and based on your chemical intuition. So it's, a, it's another tool in the, in the arsenal. Okay. Now, from a computational point of view, this, uh, this is really a first step, right? So you can say, well, um, these are our best guesses so far. We're not always right. What can we do to improve things, right? If people are already busy doing mutants, you have a few more weeks to refine your answers before they send off for the 
the DNA sequence and start putting it into bacteria. Well, what are some of the possible sources of error right, that might contribute to this? Well, there are many. There's, there's all sorts of things. There's lack of flexibility. Um, there's lack of entropy. There's lack of salvation, things like that. Now, from my background, I'm a quantum chemist. So the first problem I see is the PM6 method. So we want to, in principle, be able to do this at a higher level of theory. Uh, but again, this has to be done fairly quickly. Right? So your alternatives, what are your alternatives here? Well, it's, it's standard QMMM. In, in our hands, uh, a lot of QMMM methods are, in principle, fast, but they take an incredibly long time to set up especially if you want to do it without making errors. So that's, that's one thing. So we, we would, uh, what this is leading up to is a QMM method that's relatively easy to set up. Uh, so one thing that, that is time consuming, not CPU time consuming, but human time consuming, is to come up with some of the parameters that are needed. And so we wanted to make a parameter free method. Finally, when you look at a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these decisions you make, it's really down to a few kilocalories per mole, whether you're going to point this up or you're going to point this down. And so, uh, again, from, from my point of view, one of the, the sources of, of inaccuracies is, is sometimes the force field or the, the lack of the fact that you haven't parameterized the force field adequately. Uh, so we wanted to get away from, from a force field. Um, Skip that. So this is the method we came up with. It's called the effective fragment molecular orbital method. And uh, as you probably guessed by now, it's, it's a parameter-free QMM method that's easy to set up. And I just want to walk you through uh, the, the basics. So it's a fragmentation method. Now, I use a water cluster here just to make it a little more visible. But you can also think of these as amino acids. The, the principle is exactly the same. So we split our protein up into amino acids. So we split a water cluster up to individual water molecules. And then we calculate all the interactions um, between them. So for example, uh, we calculate the energy of an isolated amino acid, or in this case, an isolated water molecule. So, and of course, we do this for, for all of them. So this gives us, from this ab initio calculation, we get what in a force field sense would be charges, right? But here we extract not just charges, but dipoles and quadrupoles and, and things like that to so make sure that the electrostatic description uh, of, that comes from this water molecule is converged. It, we also uh, extract things that allow us to model the polarizability of this. And it's done completely automatically and on the fly. And it's done for everyone. Then from the polarizability, that's a many-body effect, right? So we calculate the, the total polarization of the entire cluster, but we do it classically, so it takes a few seconds, okay? So, but from a polarization point of view, this is n-body. It has all the effects, okay? Now, for, for things that are very close, uh, where you have other contributions uh, to the interaction energy other than electrostatics, right? So that's exchange repulsion and charge transfers, all the van der Waals forces. We compute this right now in this implementation ab initio. So we would do this uh, pair completely quantum mechanically, right? So again, to get away from things that we don't exactly know how to model non-quantum mechanically without introducing parameters. Okay, but things that are far away, so where there's no, where the van der Waals term of the energy is zero, right? This can now be calculated completely rigorously using the multipoles. And because we use higher order multipoles, this is, this is essentially exact. There's no approximation here, really, uh, as long as we're sure that there, there's no charge density overlap. OK, and so for MP2, if you go to, to correlation, uh, right, the, the idea is the same, except the MP2 is a little shorter range Right, so we do a full MP2 calculation if they're touching, and we set the, the MP2 or dispersion to zero if they're not touching. Now, in future versions, there'll be a classical 
equivalent to the dispersion here. Okay, now we're not dealing with water, we're dealing with amino acids, and so you have to treat the boundary, again, in a non-parameterized way, and so we do that by putting a frozen orbital uh, where we cut. So there's a lot of technical details, but the main point here is that this is, this is done on the fly completely automatically. Um, so some, some tests, uh, so we picked some, some small proteins where we could afford to do this fully uh, quantum mechanically with, a, with a, another method that's basically the same as, um, well, but we could do it fully quantum mechanically. And so here is the error in the total energy. So this is all the interactions within this little protein. There are little errors in each interaction. What do they add up to? Right? So about four kilocalories per mole. Now the relative energies right, are going are gonna to be much better. Um, and this is fast enough that we could imagine optimizing the geometry at the MP2 level, so including dispersion and, and electron correlation. Okay. But that's, we're not really interested in the total energies, we're interested in relative energies, and we're interested in relative energies for a reaction path, where we're only changing a small subsystem. Right? So for example, making or breaking the, the amid bond. Right? And this is really where the, the strength of this comes in. So if we say the red region is where we're breaking bonds, um, then we have a boundary region here uh, that, in, that basically has to respond in probably in a quantum mechanical way to the bond breaking and bond making. But then we have most of the rest of the protein, right, which is far enough away from the, the quantum mechanical action that, that these classical ways of treating the interaction with multipoles and dipole polarizabilities are, are, are accurate. Right? And the point is now if, if doing the optimization we can assume that this, some of this at least is rigid, right? then because all the parameters come from independent calculations on the fragments, we don't have to repeat the calculations. So basically this becomes a QMMM method Right? Where all the parameters that are out here that describe the electrostatic interaction were computed once, fully quantum mechanically, specifically for this system, right? with no adjustment of the parameters. Right? But the cost now, when we optimize the geometry to look for the trans, well, when we find the reaction path, right? the cost is basically the cost of calculating this small piece. Okay? But, uh, all the sort of the nice things from quantum mechanics, such as you know imp improving the basis set out here to get better multipoles or, or, or polarizabilities, you can still do that. Right? So you can also systematically improve this area here. Okay? But the cost, again, is relatively small. And there's no adjustable parameters anywhere in this that you have to adjust. And this is just as rigorous for the structure that would correspond to the transition state as it is for one of the the, the structures you end up with, either the reactant or the product. Okay, so, but you could actually take this all the way to an actual polarizable force field where we can take ideas from, a, from another uh, method I helped develop called the effective fragment method where you can, you can derive um, parameter-free expressions for some of the other things that are missing. Right, so exchange repulsion and, and dispersion and so forth, so that you end up doing only quantum calculations on each individual piece. And then this method really becomes very, very fast. Now, but even though it doesn't have any adjustable parameters, you still have to fragment this thing. You have to decide what pieces it should be divided into. And so practically doing that, conceptually that's not hard, practically doing that, uh, defining the charge on each fragment and things like that for a large system is time intensive. And so we developed a, a graphical user interface that does this automatically. So that it, it's, and it's available on the web and it's something where you simply upload your, your coordinates and a second later you get the, the input file that you need. Of course, this doesn't need to be on the web, it can also be a standalone thing that can be included in a script. So the main point here is that these calculations really can be set up uh, without any human intervention once you've decided what you're going to call your active 
part and what you're going to call your, your spectator part. Okay. And so then, of course, there are also um, more clever ways of looking for the transition state rather than the brute force interpolation. Uh, and so we're also working on that. But that's still, that's still to do. Okay. So that's, uh, that's all I have. I decided to keep it hopefully short. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. And as I said, the slides are available on the, on the web for anyone who's interested. Ah, okay. Yeah, so we actually, we, we, it's, it's a little uh, technical, but we, we uh, fragment it in a way that we don't create charges on the boundary. So we simply, yeah, so we, we basically, uh, uh, we, at the, where we cut, we actually split it up into electron pairs. So you have a bonding pair, uh, two electrons, and then we, we, we simply divide the nuclear charge in such a way that each fragment retains the original charge that it has. So that's, that's about as, as simply as I can. The technical details are a little tough, but the, I don't want that. you don't want to have them anyway. But the, if, you, if you start with a neutral amino acid, it remains neutral. How much time do you, yeah, so, so it's, it's significantly more expensive. So if I, we can map out a reaction path for, we've only tried it for one reaction. Uh, but with about 250 cores, we could map out the reaction in one week. So it's, it's significantly more expensive. Yeah. But uh, let's say, but all that time, virtually all that time, is computer time. It's not, there's very little setup time in this. Yeah. And it will become faster once we introduce these, these other approximations. If I may, the other question is related to your previous method. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I've got to Well, continue, please. I will, I will ask you. Okay. <coughs> Why would I have a comment at the very end? I mean, obviously this PM3 and so occasionally fails when it comes to chemistry. Were you guys thinking about using, now they have this SRP, specific reaction parameter, so that you can basically fit with 11 parameters per element plus some cross term for chemistry, so you can yeah. follow this worship school of easy theory. Yeah. Then you can do mutants relatively fast. Can you comment? Yes, so I mean, if, if PM6 completely fails, and it, prob it might for some reaction path, right? That's your only option, as the way I see it. So the, the only problem with that, and the reason for not doing it every time, is simply the, the effort it takes to parameterize it, right? So now you have a whole, uh, uh, you know, weeks or maybe months of getting these parameters just right. Right, and so that's that's the, it's a practical problem. Yeah. yeah, then you have a real business. Too. Then you say, "Oh, you're a mutant." That's true. That's true. If if yeah, I mean, it keeps yourself busy, right? But uh, other people will have a hard time using it. 